Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to class on the Welcome Kingdom of God Citizens to the Kingdom of God class. Are you all excited to learn? Yes? Okay. So welcome to our uh, online students, our uh, e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture later on, and also to our in-person students. Welcome all of you. We'll begin with a word of prayer. So I'll ask Asapu to lead us in prayer, please. Lord Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this wonderful day, my Lord. Lord, as we are stepping to this class, my Lord, God, give us our wisdom, knowledge to understand this class, my Lord. Third, Holy Spirit, help us to, un to dwell in this course, my Lord. As we are going, the entire two sections, my Lord, you give the awake mind to us, concentrate and give, give more concentrate on this subject, my Lord. In Jesus' name I pray and ask. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So today we're going to look at um, an interesting part of um, this uh, publication, The Kingdom of God. And which chapter are we in? Chapter 6. Yes. What is chapter 6? Kingdom parables. Right? How many of you? Oh. Six, kingdom culture. Okay, let me open to, <laughs> I've gone ahead to chapter seven. Uh, but yes, I'll open this kingdom culture. Yeah. I was excited about chapter seven. Okay, we'll uh, look at, um, we began looking at um, chapter six, kingdom culture. Okay. And uh, we said that, you know, um, that who has God called us to be in the kingdom of God? Who are we in the kingdom of God according to what we studied in kingdom culture last week? Yeah, we are sons and daughters, but kings and priests. Yes, okay. So Revelation 1, 5 and 6 says he has made us kings and priests to our God. Okay, so we are kings and priests so how are we in the present kings and priests as kings how are we as kings now, none of you have read and come it's all greek and latin to you we yes we represent god we resemble god we represent god's rule and reign here on the earth okay and we are to see his kingdom come here into our earthly them and as priests what are we supposed to do please take the mic and answer it will help as priests what are we supposed to do we are doing god's work here. sorry we are doing god's work here how are we doing god's work we are glorifying him worshiping him glorifying god but here in the context of kingdom of god what are we doing yes we stand on behalf of the people we intercede, we take the matters of the earth to heaven and we release what is released in heaven here on earth and we bind what is bound here on earth or bound in heaven, we bind it here on earth. Okay. And also we saw that there is a future 10 application of us being kings and priests. Okay. So when is that? When will we literally rule as kings and priests here on this earth? The second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ during the millennium kingdom. Okay. When his literal kingdom, Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Okay. Uh, when he'll come and establish that. And we will be literally, some of you will be kings. Some of you will be priests in the kingdom of God. It all depends on how faithful, how sincere you are now to what God has called you, what he has entrusted you to. Okay. So that is what we saw uh, uh, last week, okay, last Wednesday. So we'll move on. Um, uh, this kingdom of God culture is a prevailing culture, okay? Now, it's a challenge for us to establish such a culture in our community of believers where we can truly function as kings and priests in his kingdom. It is a challenge, yes or no? to be kings and priests in the kingdom of God. But when we begin, how, when can we truly function in these roles as kings and priests? 
when can we truly function in these roles as kings and priests? God has already called us kings and priests, but when can we function in this role as kings and priests? Come on. Having kingdom thinking, yes. Thank you, Lucy. Kingdom living, yes. Living according to the kingdom lifestyle, yes. We think according to the kingdom perspective. We live according to kingdom lifestyle. And then we can truly establish a strong kingdom culture. Okay. So is it possible? Yes. Because if it's not possible, God would have told us and he would not have uh, required that of us. But we can, when we think kingdom perspective and we, um, you know, when we live, we can, uh, the kingdom um, uh, lifestyle, then we can truly bring in a kingdom culture. Okay. <clears throat> and when there's a kingdom culture, what will happen? When there's a kingdom culture in our midst, what will happen? What will happen when there's a kingdom culture? In the kingdom culture, there's kingdom thinking, there's kingdom lifestyle. What happens when there's kingdom culture? We walk according to God's will and the His... Uh... Okay, that is said. Yeah, that forms a kingdom culture. But what happens when there is a kingdom culture? Yeah. His presence manifests here. Yes, uh, there's a manifest powerful presence of His presence. Uh, manifest presence, his, uh, there's a visitation of God, there's a move of God, and also there can be a revival of God, okay? And we as his people can be truly salt and light in this world, okay? So we look at a few facets of kingdom culture. Uh, first one is a kingdom, uh, a kingdom culture is a culture of honor, okay? So it's a culture where we practice honor, giving reverence and respect Okay, so who do we honor? We honor our, the, our king who is our Lord and God, who is the head of this kingdom. Okay, and uh, we also honor whom? Also, who do we honor in the kingdom? Yeah, those whom God has appointed, okay, uh, to serve in specific functions in the kingdom of God. So we honor them, okay. Uh, whether their lifestyles are right or wrong, or you know whether they're walking worthy of God or whatever, it that does not uh, does not matter. But what are we called to do? Like David honored King David honored whom? Yes. Okay. So even when he was uh, you know uh, filled with jealousy and hatred and pursuing King, uh, David, but yet he honored the King. Okay. So. It is important that we honor the king of the kingdom and also we honor those God has appointed in various functions in the kingdom of God. Those who basically, First Timothy, Paul says and writes to Timothy in First Timothy chapter 5 verse 17, he says, you know, honor people uh, who lead God's people well and also who labor in word and doctrine. Okay, and what does he say? Look at First Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. What kind of honor should we give such people who lead God's people well and who labor in word and doctrine? What kind of honor should we give them? What does Paul say? First Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders who rule will be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Yes. So what kind of honor we give them? Double honor. Okay. We honor everybody in the kingdom of God, irrespective of their social status or their positions or their education, um, all of that. But we also give double honor to those who uh, lead God's people well, who labor in the word, word who preach and teach the uh, doctrine. So when you honor someone, what, what are you basically doing? When you honor someone, what are you doing? You're respecting them. So what is the meaning of respect? Okay, what is honor and respect? <laughs> respect. 
you are giving value yes you are expressing your value you know you're valuing them uh, for who they are and what they mean to you the position that they are and through your honor you're saying that hey what you do and who you are is of great value and we respect that okay so how do you show honor to people or how do you show respect to people how do you show respect and honor to people by your action by your talking behavior. by your action the way you talk to them the way you uh, uh, reply to them you speak highly of them you don't uh, you refuse to you know defame them talk behind their backs and you know uh, defame them and um, when when they are in your presence you stand up you applaud the person or you can even give financially into their lives or you can serve them in any way just to show you want to honor that person okay one of these ways you serve them you give financially into their lives you applaud them you know you st uh, you stand up in their presence just to give them the respect and the honor and also you speak highly of uh, them and you don't defame them what happens when you honor the people that god has placed in your life what happens huh you receive god you receive god's blessings okay what else you also receive through their life right uh, when you honor a prophet a righteous man or a disciple for who they are in the kingdom of god you receive a prophet's reward right look at what matthew chapter 10 verses 41 and 42 says can somebody read that please anyone likes to read matthew 10 41 and 42 Matthew 10, 41 and 42. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Yes, so here it says when you honor someone, you receive from their life. When you honor a prophet, a righteous man, a disciple for who they are in the kingdom of God, you receive a reward uh, uh, that represents who they are. So what does this mean? That you receive, when you honor a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. What does it mean? They bless you, okay? It means that when you honor and support a prophet in their role in their mission you share in their spiritual blessings you share in their rewards that come uh, through their ministry so, uh, and you by honoring them you participate in the work they're doing for god and uh, you benefit from the blessings uh, that you receive through their lives or through their ministry or through their service and the favor of god that has been placed on their lives okay the grace the favor the anointing that is on their lives you also receive it from them okay so in essence it's about recognizing and respecting the call of god's servants okay and receiving blend uh, blessings uh, in return for the honor and support that you are giving them okay i like what uh, pastor bill johnson uh, pastor of Bethel Church, Redding, California. He was sharing in one of his sermons. And he said that Elisha was trained by Elijah. Okay, Elisha was trained by Elijah. And um, Elisha carried a double portion of the anointing that was on Elijah. So he carried a double portion of the anointing and the power that was on Elijah. And he produced twice the number of miracles that even Elijah did yes or no but when john the baptist who was a forerunner of jesus he came uh, when he came he came in the spirit and power of whom elijah not elisha okay why was that even though elisha had a double portion of anointing and power even though Eli Eli uh, elisha did more miracles than elijah but john the baptist was the forerunner of jesus came in the spirit and power of not of elisha but Elijah. Why? John the Baptist honoring Elijah. Okay. 
So Pastor Bill Johnson says that he explains that God honors the father of a movement. He honors the fathers of the movement. Lucy says Elijah was the master and not Elisha. Good, yes. Okay. So uh, Pastor Bill Johnson explains that, you know, God honors the fathers of a movement and he places honor on who paid the price and sowed the seeds to pioneer a fresh move of God's spirit. So who started off the fresh move of God's spirit? It was Elijah, right? So he says that, you know, God honors the father of a movement or fathers of movements. And he also places honor on those who paid the price and sowed the seeds to pioneer a fresh move of God in a place. Okay. So that is a culture of honor. So in our kingdom or in your kingdom, you have to have a culture of honor. And we're talking about kingdom culture. We're not only talking about in the context of church, but we're also talking in the context of our family, our home, right? We need to honor those whom God has placed above us in the, in the workplace, okay? In the, in the society that we live, in the, go the government that we need to honor, okay? Second one is a culture of selfless giving. So the kingdom culture is a culture of selfless giving. And when you're in this process of selfless giving, you are, you know, experiencing the joy of giving. So your giving is not something that is going to be something like a struggle for you, but it's going to be something that is of a joy. So what could you give in the kingdom of God? What are the things you have to give in the kingdom of God? Your efforts, okay? Time. Okay, you, you sacrifice what? You sacrifice your time, you sacrifice your efforts. What else? Finances, yes. Your support. Okay, the gifts that you've given to use it, okay? Even the comforts that you have. You know, yesterday we saw the first uh, spark of, re of reformation was started by this rich businessman who went about teaching from Matthew chapter 10. And he gave up all his luxuries and his, his comforts. So he was a rich man, right? Okay, so, so there are many other things that we can, you know, um, give uh, selflessly for building or extending the kingdom of God. What is the characteristic of selfless giving? What do you think are some of the characteristics of selfless giving? Don't look at your limitations, okay? What else? What is the characteristics of selfless giving? Love, okay? If you don't have love, you can't give. Yes. Love is the basis. What else? Huh? You have a heart to, to give, yes. A heart of love to give. What else? Not expecting anything back, yes. Empathizing with others, okay. What does the Bible talk about giving? Give? Cheerfully, cheerfully yes. Give cheerfully, give gladly. Uh, and also your giving should be not somebody forcing you. Not out of com compulsion. Oh, I have to give. Pastor is asking, oh, you know, my parents are asking me to give. I have to give, you know. Or... Um, you know, my maid is in a, uh, in a in a financial struggle. She's asking me to give. I have to give her, you know, and she won't leave me in peace. Or she'll not, she'll leave the job. Then what will I do? I won't find anybody else. So it's not of, out of compulsion, but it is spontaneous, okay? It comes from the heart, okay? Um, and also selfless giving is, you know, people in the kingdom of God who work behind the scenes, right? Uh, who are go unnoticed and unappreciated, okay? So sometimes there are people on the stage, they get all the recognition and applause, but there are many people working behind the scenes, you know, uh, to make the person who they are. So for example, if you grow up or you become a great evangelist, a pastor, or a great businessman, or a great businesswoman, or accomplish something great, you know, who's there behind you, who supported you? 
your parents, right? Your parents who prayed hard for you so that you can walk in the right way, you can do things they earned, they fed you, they took care of you. So there, there are a lot of people who work behind the scenes, who go unnoticed and unappreciated, but that is selfless giving, okay? And uh, they do it for the sake of, you know, the responsibility they have, okay? They do it because God has called them to, they assigned them to uh, do it. And so we see that selfless giving in the kingdom of God is, uh, you know, those who forsake all of their earthly opportunities. Sometimes people forsake earthly opportunities, their successes, and they invest their time and energy in just serving God and furthering the kingdom of God. So sometimes we see people, you know, uh, just just uh, see a need and they can just give their whole monthly salary to an orphanage or to a to mission work. Just just give, you know, or they can just give their savings for a church that needs to be built, whatever. So that is selfless giving. OK, and it's also giving like Deepu said, we don't expect anything back from those who, you know, we have given. OK, but we know that God will reward us in due time and it's also like you said akil said that is a giving that is motivated out of love love from the heart like bimal said okay and love for god and for his people okay okay and we read in matthew chapter 25 verse 4, 40 jesus said in must and in as much as you did it to one of the least of my brethren you did it to me so when we help others when we pour into people's lives we're actually doing it for the lord okay the next one is a culture of daring faith. Okay, a culture of daring faith is, what do you think is the meaning of this? Culture of daring faith. Uh, thinking of the impossible, just thinking of the impossible. <laughs> believing in the impossible, just believing and doing the impossible, okay. Taking the risks, okay, what else? What is the culture of daring faith? Without fear, yes. Boldness, just uh, depending and fully trusting on God's word to see God come through. What else? Trusting God. Ah, you're not looking at yourself, you're not looking at your own limitations, but you're looking at who God is and what he can do, okay? So culture of daring faith is about people who trust God completely, even in the face of challenges, even in the face of difficulties, they're willing to take bold steps, even though those steps might be risky and difficult, uh, but they take it because they want to go about doing God's purpose, fulfilling God's purpose for their lives, okay? Some examples like Peter walking on the water, okay, Matthew chapter 14 verse 29. Uh, Peter saw Jesus walking on the water and with daring faith he said, he asked Jesus if he can come also walking on the water to Jesus and what does Jesus say? He said, come, you know, call them. So Peter stepped on the boat, he walked, okay, it was a risk of, risk act of faith, okay? Even though later Peter, you know, doubted, but he was willing to take that first step, you know, which exemplifies his daring faith, okay? What other example in the Bible that we can see? Old Testament, we learn in Sunday school, very famous story. <laughs> David and Goliath, yes. You know, David and Goliath, we see David as a young shepherd, you know, and uh, he was ready to take on Goliath, okay? With what? Sword, spear, javelin, everything he went to fight Goliath, right? No, he went just with a sling and he went with a stone, okay? And uh, just a sling and a, and a stone, what else? Sling, stone and? Faith, yes, sling, stone, and faith. Thank you, Akil and Lucy. Okay, with a sling, stone, and faith in God. He tells, I come in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. He has faith that God can, you know, just defeat this huge Goliath. 
Okay, so despite all of the odds, he just trusted in God that God would give him the victory, and that led to a miraculous victory for Israel. Okay, so many uh, uh, missionaries who go into dangerous areas, not only just dang dangerous areas, but also difficult areas, like William Carey came to India, uh, you know, in uh, Kolkata, infested with mosquitoes, malaria, you know, he lost his. Uh, children because of sicknesses like that. So many missionaries that we um, read where they risk their lives, their family, their children, their safety, their reputation, uh, just trusting God that God would protect them and use them to bring the gospel uh, uh, to the people, right? When you see uh, William Carey, his wife became mad, he lost his children, his, his printing press, everything, hard work was burnt up. But finally, he um, translated the Bible, I think, in Uriya, in Bengali, I think Assamese as well. You know, we'll study that in, in uh, Christian missions. But just such wonderful work of God that these men and women of God um, did go, went to China. It's all difficult places compared to, you know, America and um, in um, England, which was well advanced in those days coming to these kind of places was so in you know um, uh, filled with uh, uh, disease and infections and sicknesses but we're just willing to come because they want that heart to selflessly give of the gospel and share the gospel okay so there are many people who give up everything just go and serve the lord even business leaders or people in the workplace corporate field, wherever, you know, wherever you're working, you know, they, um, you know, they take, have a daring faith, they make some choices to follow biblical, biblical principles of honesty, integrity, even if they're losing their profit, okay, or they're facing a backlash, or they are, you know, saying that if you don't do this, you won't get a promotion, you won't get increment, they're saying it's okay, but we will not do anything that is unethical, that is not right, and that is not honest in God's eyes, okay, so believers praying for healing, yeah, that also requires daring faith, yes or no, right, when we're believing and pressing in, uh, and intervening for the supernatural, and, um, you know, uh, such people are willing to even take disappointments and rejection, okay? They're doing it just uh, to step in and pray for people so that people can be healed and restored and their situations can be transformed. So this is a type of daring faith that not only brings personal victories, but also advances the kingdom of God and it demonstrates God's power and glory to others. It's also a culture of joy. Okay, why do we say it's a culture of joy? Why do you say the kingdom of God is a culture of joy? The kingdom of God is what? Dash. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Okay, so how is the king? Uh, uh, is, how is the culture of joy? How can we bring in this culture of joy? How can we bring culture of joy in the kingdom of God? How can you bring the culture of joy in your family or in your workplace or in the church? How can you bring that culture? Huh? Sorry? How do you how do you show that culture of joy? How do you live in the kingdom culture? That brings joy. When okay, when you're selflessly giving, okay, when you're praying, preaching the good news, okay. What else? Loving you, people. Sorry, uh, get rude. Loving people. Yes, when you love, love people. Sorry. Yes, when you love people in spite of what they do to you or what they have, how they have hurt you, just loving them, not doing tit for tat, not getting back at them, you know, not gossiping, not slandering, not defaming them, not bringing about division, right? Sometimes in our families, you know, it's sad that husbands and wives, you know, uh, take children and partner with them and there's a strife, there's a division in the family. 
right? Or sometimes children cite their parents, sometimes children cite their, you know, their grandparents. So there is strife in the, in the body of Christ. We don't have to talk about it. We all know in our workplace, there is so much of strife and division and disunity. And some of us can also be people who birth that, who, you know, uh, make that to grow, you know, slander, gossiping, all of that can destroy or steal the joy. Okay, and um, we see that, you know, when Philip went to Samaria, Acts chapter 8, we studied about that, right? And uh, he spoke and preached in the name of Jesus Christ, and he did things concerning the kingdom of God. That means he did by these signs, miracles, and wonders. And what does the Bible say? There was great joy in that city. Why was there great joy? Why, why was there great joy? Why was there great joy in the city of Samaria? Because they received salvation, the gospel, and what else? People were healed and restored, and there were signs, miracles, and wonders. So there was joy. The kingdom culture of joy was there in their midst. Okay? Yes, because the move of the Holy Spirit, yes, we see that, you know, unclean spirits left, the lame were healed and made whole, and people rejoiced because of the work of God, okay? So when people experience righteousness, peace, and joy, in a, a typical example is the city of Samaria, okay? There is a great joy in their midst. So we need to ask this question, is there joy in our families? I'm not talking about just happiness, you know, sometimes we're laughing, most of the time we're fighting, we're not talking to each other, we're not looking at each other. You know, is there joy in our families? Okay, sometimes I know it's there, sometimes it's not there. But what is the majority of the time? What, what rules? Is there strife, division, unrest, unpeace? Or most of the time is there peace? Now you need to answer that for yourself. You know, the churches that you come from, is there joy, there's peace, or there's people turning, oh, she's coming, oh, he's coming, and, you know, looking away, or running away, you know, or when they're coming, you're looking up at the sky, you didn't know the sky was blue, and the sun is shining, you know, you or you're, you know, as soon as church is over, you're meeting, gossiping, who oh, this, this, and that, and all of that, you know, what pastor should have spoken, what he should not have done, what he should have worn, how he came on stage, all of those things, you know. Is there a culture of joy. What are we promoting? We need to ask ourselves that. In the Bible college, now all of you in-person students, you're in Bible college. Is there a culture of joy here? <laughs> you need to think for yourself. Just think for yourself. Is there a culture of joy in your uh, hostel dormitory? You have few people. Is there a culture of joy? Right? What I'm saying is not just laughing and saying, hi, hello, good morning, praise the Lord. But Joy means, you know, yeah, are you praying for each other, supporting each other, you know, enjoying each other's company? You know, that is a culture of joy. If it's not there, we are supposed to bring in that culture of joy. Why should we bring in the culture of joy? Why? Why should we bring the culture of joy? Ayo. Huh? That's why we are called for, okay? Why should we bring the culture of joy? Hello? We are kingdom citizens. We belong to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is in us. And we are supposed, wherever we go, the kingdom of God is supposed to be spreading through us. Okay? So, uh, that is what we are supposed to do okay even when we go through persecutions even when you go through difficulties we should experience the joy of the lord you know the joy of the lord will not be robbed from us okay um the joy of the lord is not you know laughing merry making joking and all that the joy of the lord is a sense of calmness assurance and peace in the midst of any and every 
situation, whether it's a difficult situation, a painful situation, a situation of loss, situation of disappointment, it is uh, something that brings in joy. Okay. So look at what First Peter chapter 1, verse 8 says. Can somebody read that? Joy inexpressible and full of glory. Yes. The kingdom culture is an environment of such joy inexpressible and full of glory. That means even in the Bible college, if there is no drums, if there's no mic system, there's no uh, keyboard, bass, uh, guitar, guitar, you should be able to praise and worship God with joy. Okay. That is joy inexpressible and full of glory. That should be the kind of culture and environment that we need to bring in. Okay. So even as we're looking at all of these um, points, I want you to think in your own lives. Is there a culture of joy in my family, in my kingdom? First of all, in me. Or am I a person running around with a long face, sad face, depressed face, thinking the whole weight of the world is upon me? You know, uh, I, uh, a culture of daring, faith. I'm, I'm a person who is having daring faith just to believe God, to step out in faith. You know, uh, selfless giving, okay? And also culture of honor. Am I honoring people, okay? And is that, is the same culture there in my family? What should I do to bring this culture into the, the kingdom that God has? place me. So if these things are not there in you, you cannot take it out wherever you go. Okay. So if you have filled with bitterness, hatred, anger, selfishness, that is what will come out of you. But if you have the kingdom culture, the kingdom lifestyle, kingdom thinking, that will permeate, that will radiate, that will come out when wherever you are. Are you able to understand? Yes? No? Okay, the last thing is it's a culture of heaven invading earth. Okay, so kingdom culture will not be complete if there is no manifestation of heaven on earth. That's why Jesus asked us to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we need to pray that. Pray that over your life, pray that over your family, pray that over your workplace, your church, your Bible study group, you're leading a youth group, you're leading a children's group, you're leading uh, any ministry, just pray that over your, um, uh, you know, the sphere of influence that God has um, given you, okay? Um, so it is God's will that the lost to be saved, the sick to be healed, the demons to be cast out, the captives to be set free, the prisoners to be, you know, um, set free from their bondages, the poor to hear the good news, the homeless to have a shelter, the hungry to be fed, the naked to be clothed, the widows and orphans to be cared for, those who are mistreated to receive, you know, encouragement, hope and relief. And everything depends on heaven invading earth. And how do we do that? Yes, we pray that firstly, and then selfless, giving, okay, and being uh, mindful, sensitive, and that is how we can bring in a culture where there's an environment where all of these things happen. Amen? Okay. Any questions? Chapter 6. Please use the mic. Whatever we studied in this chapter, do we actually see all of it on a smaller scale or uh, in, with our natural eyes or is it actually less compared to where how much it should be? Is it actually less compared yeah. to? How much it should be? What my question is, oh, okay. whatever we have studied about kingdoms, culture, and thing in our lives, families, homes, do we see it less because our focus is on all the other things or is it actually less? Compared to Do how we much... see it less or in reality is it less? Yes, yes, yes. What we see is what is we see in reality, right? That is what we can perceive. What in reality is happening, we see that, right? 
But we need to understand there is no perfect church, there is no perfect workplace, there is no perfect family, there is no perfect home. Uh, there are things that happen, but what can we do in spite of all the imperfections to bring in the kingdom culture? Yes. So if it's not there, we are learning now. So what can we do to bring this kingdom culture? What can I do? And uh, don't think, OK, it's only me. What can I do? But God can do great things through you. We see that in church history, right? You know how he used a single person to just spark that revival or that reformation, that move of God. There's nothing that God cannot do. So he can change. And uh, God has given us the authority, right? We learned about kingdom authority, right? And who we have the backing of the king of kings. You know, we have the backing of heaven and he can bring, when he said, pray thy kingdom come on earth as, as on heaven, you know, means he can do it. He will do it. And why don't we see it? Because we don't pray. We are not mindful. We are not pressing in uh, till we see what God can do. Yes. Did that help answer your question? Okay. Anyone else? Any questions? Can we use those things while preaching on the stage? Like, uh, can we use uh, kingdom culture while uh, preaching on the stage? Like how we live uh, in loving, peacefully, how we talk normally here. But uh, some uh, preachers, when they go to stage, I've seen like they preach like shouting more over, like looks like overacting type. Of. I think it's their style of uh, preaching. And also sometimes they think that when when they preach with gusto, some people have loud voice like me, inbuilt microphone. I don't need microphones. Inbuilt microphone I have. So even if I speak, you know, speak loudly, some people can take it very offensively. Uh, so I'm trying to, you know, learn to speak a little softly and the sun so. But some people have that gusto, they speak with that bang, 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 they're those kind. Some people very soft, very this one, different personalities. But sometimes also people just think that, you know, when we preach with gusto and loudly and, you know, go bang, bang, bang and all of those things, then people think there's greater anointing that is flowing, the power of God is moving, the power of God will come and all that. That is because of the wrong uh, perspective and thinking of how they've seen other men and women of God do, but that does not uh, really bring in the anointing and the power of God. Even if you're very quietly, meekly speaking, the power and anointing of God can flow. Yeah. But there are some people, you know. Teachers, the joy of the Lord is the same as The thing has automatically gone video. Just look at your son. Is it back now? Okay. So Andrew's question is the joy of the Lord is the same as laughter anointing. What do you think? So joy of the Lord, same as laughter anointing. Huh? Audio is not there. Oh no. Okay, let's look at the settings. Sorry, everyone, there is some audio talk. It says microphone logitech cam for audio. I have to move it to yes. line two, no? Yes. Line two. And speaker, speaker two USB. Headset, head, oh, headphone, real tech. Now is it coming? Okay. I don't know why it keeps changing the settings. Sorry, everyone. Okay, so is the joy of the Lord the same as laughter anointing? You know what is laughter anointing, no? Laughter anointing is, you know, when people, um, uh, you know, when people lay their hands and pray for some, and they start laughing. They're uh, laughing and laughing and continuously laughing for sometimes for three three hours, four hours, five hours, six hours. It's the laughter anointing. 
Oh, it's for many years now. When in the 90s also I have seen huh? laughter uh, anointing. So they just say that you're filled with the joy of the Lord. Yeah, just different ways the Holy Spirit manifests. But we need to know if this laughter anointing is, you know, making that person really tired at the end of it, making them fatigue and tired. Or even after the three or four hours of continuous laughing, are they filled with the, the power and uh, the life of God? Because when I encountered this for the first time in the 90s, I, um, you know, whole night this, uh, they were praying and then, you know, this person was laughing the whole night in the morning and I asked that person, he said, I've got, I'm so tired and exhausted and my tummy is paining. So I thought if it is a move, I didn't know about Holy Spirit because we were not taught about Holy Spirit in our Bible college or I come from the Methodist background, there is no teaching of Holy Spirit. Then I thought if, I just knew if it is the work of God, there should be that joy, that radiance, that transformation of life that needs to happen. Okay. So Andrew's question, is the joy of the Lord the same as laughter anointing? No. The joy of the Lord is what? The joy of the Lord is something, yes, it is also accompanied with love and peace of God. The joy of the Lord is, you know, in spite of you going through difficult circumstances and situations and challenges, you can still experience the overwhelming peace and joy of the Lord, even in that midst of difficulty, pain, brokenness, grief. That is what we're talking about, culture of joy. Okay, or the kingdom culture of joy, or righteousness, peace, and joy that characteriz uh, characterizes the kingdom of God. And it's not the same as laughter anointing. No, yes. Please use a, the mic. Uh, any biblical reference, ma'am, about laughter anointing or something no, there similar? There is no uh, biblical Nothing reference to uh, laughter anointing, but we need to know that the Holy Spirit can also manifest itself in different ways. It's one of the ways. Yeah. But always you need to know the fruit. What is a fruit? I'm not saying laughter anointing is wrong. I'm saying what is a fruit? That person's life is transformed. They're filled with the joy, the power, the... Sister, no audio. Oh. Uh, yes, sister. Now can you hear me? Yes, yes, sister. We can it's hear you. Microphone Logitech. But it's gone to microphone Logitech. Is it okay? It's only showing that microphone Logitech and mic microphone array. Okay, fine. We'll uh, have two more minutes and we can check it again when the break time. Okay, yes. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, in the, in the life of... How can you have the culture of joy? You tell me how you can have the culture of joy. Joy. Huh? Because it comes from who? The Holy Spirit. Come God. Irrespective of the situations. Right? Irrespective of the situation. Not that he did not mourn, not that he was not heartbroken, not he was grieved, but you know, his that is what we're saying, selfless giving, culture of selfless giving. In spite of going through all this. He was willing to selflessly give into the kingdom of God, fulfill his calling. And there was joy and peace even in that, in the midst of pain, brokenness, and difficulty, because that is what the Holy Spirit puts in us. It's not something we can reproduce, right? It's like the fruit of the Spirit, we can't reproduce it in ourselves, the work of the Holy Spirit. The same way. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, sister. No, it was just going and coming back. Like questions. Uh, before we move on, there's just one more minute for the break. Then we'll move on to kingdom parables. How many of you like parables? How many of you enjoy parables online? You see some hands. Thank you, Andrew, Lucy, Deepu. What about the others? Kofi, Divya, Gertrude. Okay, thank you. The others don't like parables. 
Okay. Uh, we look at kingdom parables after we come back. Thank you, Shaker. We'll come back after class and look at kingdom parables. Thank you, everyone.